pulls in the bottom, and those are our locomotor activity uh, cataloged in each of our different centers. And then we have the loading of those observed variables onto our latent unobserved variable, which is our generalized locomotor activity trait. And so when we take this uh, multivariate analysis uh, and plot them in patent plot for our SNPs, this is the Mayahat plot we get out and the QQ plot. And then uh, similarly externalizing, as I said before, with an umbrella trait. And they used the exact same method in humans. So the externalizing uh, consortium used a common factor uh, structural equation modeling method to identify an externalizing trait. And the uh, externalizing trait was defined from seven different phenotypes in humans. And it was number of sexual partners, lifetime smoking initiation, problematic alcohol use, ADHD, lifetime cannabis use, age at first sexual intercourse reverse coded, and general risk tolerance. And they defined a uh, latent unobserved externalizing trait in 1.5 million people with European background. And when they did that, this is the Manhattan plot that we get out. I'm not gonna uh, spend too long on this because we're talking about genes. So uh, <clears throat> we can't translate signal across species very easily on the SNP level. So by necessity, we had to aggregate our signal into a gene level. And so I used MAGMA for this particular analysis. There's a lot of argument that can be had on which method you use. And so I've been testing some other ones as well. But MAGMA is a proximity-based algorithm where it takes all of the SNPs within the range of the gene's locus and aggregates those into a gene-wide p-value. And so I did that for humans and rats because I want to keep it as close as possible. And so for the rats, I used a false discovery rate of 0.05 as a cutoff. And for humans, I used the top 500 genes. And the reason I did that is because of a thing called the small world principle in uh, network biology, which is very simply the idea that if you populate a network of, say, 5,000 genes with three and a half thousand genes, <laughs> then run a propagation algorithm, you're going to get signal across everything. So by necessity, you have to limit the number of genes that you put in. Otherwise, it's just going to bring out everything. That being said, I did try this with all of those genes, and it did work. <laughs> Thanks. So if we look at our 500 genes for externalizing and our uh, false discovery rate of 0.05 cutoff genes for humans, we find that there's 15 genes that overlap across the two species, which is a non-significant overlap. However, if we then use our framework, which I described before, and we run network propagation, we uh, can identify the proximity for each of these genes in the gene network to the um, to the seed genes. And so what that is, is in yellow and purple the, and pink, those lines, those are our cutoffs for network proximity uh, score for rats, humans, and humans and rats. Um, in gray are all of the nodes in PCNet, which is our interactome that we're using. And then in pink are those nodes that reach the cutoff and therefore are part of our co-localized network. And then in dark pink are those genes that came out of the GWAS, so our seed genes. And in this diagonal, you'll see a lovely line and those are all our shared seed genes. So they're highly proximal to both the rat and the human genes. And so the first question is, is this real? Like, what is this? Is this real? So the first test that we used to do that is we looked at permuting the uh, rat seed genes and comparing the co-localization with the human genes to determine whether or not if you just use a random number of genes or like the same number of genes randomly throughout the network with similar location within the network or like uh, heat within the network, do you get the same signal? And the answer is no. So we used a um, Z test to determine whether the mean of the permuted, which is shown in the uh, histogram, is equal to the observed, which is the pink arrow. We found that it's highly significantly different. So the externalizing and locomotor genes in, like, identify a co-localized network that is significantly larger than expected by humans. <laughs> and so this is what the network looks like. Uh, you can't read these genes because they're Wait, it's too small, but don't worry about it. Um, so it has about 300 genes in it. Uh, roughly 50 are uh, from each of the uh, different data sets, and then 14 of those genes are shared. And then the next question is, how do we validate this? Can we show that this is actually real signal outside of just a network-based approach? So what we did is we used data from the MGI, which we heard about earlier. And so they used the mammalian phenotype ontology for a molecular perturbation uh, phenotypic data. 
So rather than validating all these genes ourselves, I am using data sets that have been previously curated because you guys did such a good job doing that. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> so um, it has a hierarchical structure, as I'm sure you all know. And so looking at just the highest level of that hierarchical structure, we I looked for enrichment for each of these different terms and found that the only terms that are enriched are behavioral neurological phenotype and nervous system phenotype. If I go a teeny bit deeper, just so that we can get a little more idea of what those are, uh, yeah, so yeah, those are significant ones. If I go a little bit deeper, these are the uh, communities that are several rungs down that are significantly enriched. And so we have various, um, across the entire um, uh, nervous system development and morphological traits, they're enriched. Behavior is really interesting, and I'm very excited that such things came out because um, normal motor capability and movement, et cetera, came out, which is great because that includes locomotor activity. So we know that we're pulling locomotor activity back out again. It's not just getting dissipated into the ethos. <laughs> and then we also ether. And then we also got um, a sensory capability, social, which is a big component of externalizing, emotional, which is also a big externalizing trait, behavioral response is xenobiotic, which relates closely to substance use disorder and finally cognition. And then the only trait that came out that wasn't uh, behavioral or nervous system is muscle twitch. So um, one could argue that it's a little off the beaten path of what we expected, but muscle twitch for a locomotor trait is not a hugely shocking thing to come out of an analysis. So this is very preliminary work. I'm still ongoing. We have a lot of follow-up to do, but. On the whole, we found that externalizing behavior and locomotor activity does identify shared genetic signal, which is fantastic. And I'm really excited about that because it has answered a 30 year old question on is this phenotype actually reflecting the human behavior? Um, network propagation identified the conserved network, which is much more overlapping than expected. And finally, the outcoming network contains numerous genes related to neuropsychiatric function. And this is validated in the MGI. And I also, I didn't have a chance to show it, but it also validates in the GWAS catalog. And with that, I would like to thank the P50 Center, of course, all of the uh, rats <laughs> and the techs that did hundreds of hours of work that went into all of this, um, the lab, Abe in particular, and the externalizing consortium and my university. And without I take any questions. Hi, Emily. I love this. Do you have a price line that can do that? I want to Yes. It is called Net Colo. It's like the whole thing. Like Made that from today. Um, I ended up tuning a lot of parameters, but we the BMI uh, paper should have everything you need to run it. It starts with the genes. So you have to decide what gene mappings work. But after that, so. There isn't a super great way of doing it without to be honest. I have to assume we have to take it to the gene level, so I can't really complete it. Um, as I said, I've been trying different gene mapping, so I tried actually what I was doing earlier just to check with. Uh, we ran Fusion, which is TWAS, and I use that signal. We've also tried network co localization to see if it co localizes and it does co localize across all the data sets, which is great. But outside of that, there's not. One hopes that that signal is being captured by the protein-protein interactions, the gene regulation interactions that are components of PCNet, which unfortunately I didn't have a chance to talk about, but it's a great tool and a really great paper if you're interested. In it. Sarah Wright just uh, put her free run up for a new PCNet, and she tests all the different interactomes and how well they perform and recapitulating disease phenotype, I mean, disease genes that you put in other disease genes. So. But outside of that, I, I'm afraid I don't have a great answer to that. Well, none of us do. Thank you.
laser pointer. You might be able to point it at the top. I think you can come down, you can come down and still advance your slide. I will say it, uh, it is robust to false positives, but it also is, depending on what cutoffs you use, and I use fairly stringent cutoffs, it can, um, it's pretty stringent. I've had, I've tried this with a lot of different sites, and it does not perform mm -hmm. as well as this. So it actually must be just something to celebrate. <laughs> Next, we're going to move to um, technology extraction and first down the city. And you're here from the PSMC, which is a technology extraction technology in the real estate. Thank you, Lauren McGee and Patrick. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I will present you how we are uh, playing with the uh, multiple sequencing technologies to assemble rad genomes. Of course, we start from the hybrid right diversity panel, but we are focusing on these two samples and they F1 correspond to F1 sample. Uh, so this is the, this will be the trio, but in reality, what we have are just three male rats. So this might be an approximation of the trio if you look at the autosomes, but not for the sex chromosome. So we have these three rats and we have this data. For the two inbred strains, we had PacBio high favorites, roughly 40x coverage, so pretty good. For the F1 sample, we have uh, nanopore reads, 81x coverage, of which 36 are ultra long reads, so more longer than 100 kilobases. With this data, we did the assemblies. For the two inbred strains, we took the PacBio high favorites and we applied high fi ASM to get haploid assemblies. Instead, for the F1 um, sample, we try, try three different strategies. The first one uh, I called the rat salad strategies because we, we mixed all the samples all together. So we are mixing three different animals, three males. Uh, but I did this to, to get a reference to compare with. Because nowadays, um, the good practice to get high quality assemblies is to combine high fi reads, ultra long reads, so we did the same to compare at least uh, regarding uh, um, the autosomes. Second strategy, very interesting, is to use only nanobore reads to get a nanobore only assembly. Here um, we correct, we applied Perro to correct nanobore reads. Perro is a tool that, that can allow you to correct the reads and to achieve an accuracy that is similar to the accuracy of the high fi reads. In the last cases, we still used nanopore reads to make the assembly, and we used the bio, bio high fi reads to as trio information to get a phased deployed assembly. In this case, uh, we have to use a Verco because high fi ASM with this configuration never finished. The only difference, unfortunately, so different assemblers. So we have three these old these assemblies, we checked the quality. Uh, about the their contiguity, here you can see the two breast strains, hi-fi only. We add nanobore reads. Here are non-corrected reads, corrected reads. So hi-fi plus uncorrected or corrected reads. The number of content is similar. Instead, unfortunately, for the nanobore only assembly, we get higher number of contacts. You can see here a spike of the number of contigs. This is the nanopore plus trio information. Something went wrong. And I checked the problem here comes from uh, mainly from the sex chromosome. Here, chromosome Y went heavily wrong. Uh, I think here we are hitting a bug of the tool. If you look at the asymmetric length. This is the length of the reference, listed reference, roughly the same, except for the last cases. Here we got half a gigabase roughly. This one comes only from chromosome Y. So it went very, very badly. Uh, to better check the contiguity, you see this kind of NX curves. So you take all contigs, sort by length, and start to take those and check. What's the length of the contigs? Consider 10% of the assembly, 20%, 50%. Fifty percent is 10, 50. This is the latest rat reference, scaffold level, solid line, and dashed line, contig level. So 
the hi-fi only assemblies, I put the same, the high high ploy, so I put the same curves on both plots. They are a little bit close, um, of course, than the reference contig level. If we add uncorrected number of reads, we, go, we get better assemblies, a little bit better than the con ah, sorry, all the curves that are colored, of course, are contig level, scaffolds. So if we add uncorrected number of reads, we get a better contiguity. If we add the corrected reads, even better. You can see here a jump. So we are resolving chromosomes T to T, telomere to telomere. The nanobar only is still good, but uh, you can see, I hope you can see here on the bottom, uh, it's highlighted that uh, the contiguity is good, but we still get too many contigs, a lot of short contigs. You can see here at the end. Last case, even worse. You can see here, particularly, a huge amount of contigs that are destroying the statistics of this, uh, this configuration. What about the correctness? Here we are checking the quality value. Here you check the keymers from the reads, the keymers from the assembly, and you don't want the assembly to have keymers that are not present in the reads. The quality is roughly similar, a little bit worse if you add nanobar reads, only nanobar reads. Yeah, you understood there are problems. We also checked the structural errors. And unfortunately, if you add nanobar reads, they increase in number. Uh, all the type of error increase, increase. Um, expansions, lapses, habitat switches. Here you have zero because haploid has something you can have, you can't have uh, switches errors, number of inversions. So number of reads tend to give you a bit uh, less um, correct assemblies. Try to improve our assemblies by applying nano, um, adaptive sequencing. That's a nanopore way to enrich your reads um, for the read that comes from a region of interest. So we took the nanopore only assembly, we mapped against the reference, and we checked what we are still missing. And we enriched for reads coming from there. And we added um, a little bit more. So um, 6x coverage in reads coming from this adaptive sequencing, a little bit more culture on. Then we try again. If we take high fi reads from different strains, plus the nanobar reads, so uh, the one that before, plus the new ones, you can see orange, red, so red is with adaptive sequencing. So we are improving a little bit the contiguity of the assembly. If we correct the reads, even better. Unfortunately, I don't have the case with nanobar only assembly because my FIASM is still running right now after 10 days. I think we are hitting up again a bug here. Uh, it's stuck at the nanopore alignment, unfortunately. But, but this is to say that adaptive sequencing is working. We checked also if the correction is working. That's uh, because uh, people are complaining on GitHub uh, about the problem of the error correct the corrections. It's because um, in human, it seems to discard reads coming from repetitive regions. This is a hole created in the HSAT in human. We checked in our case, we don't have this kind of problem. And actually, if you take, um, these are nanobar reads, uncorrected lines against a reference. Corrected reads, against the reference, high fi reads from the embedded strains against the reference. This is just a random chunk of the alignments. Surprising that uh, the corrected reads are a little bit better than high fi reads. That was surprising, at least to me. I was expecting uh, to be comparable or a little bit worse than high fi reads. So the correction is working pretty, pretty good. You can see the, here you have a deployed sample. You can see the variance coming from the SHR, for example. You can see here, you can appreciate. Error is working, but uh, it has a cost. Potential also about uh, what you lose. Here you can see the number of reads that you have before and after the correction, you lose some reads. Here, the read uh, after adaptive sequencing, and we also updated the new error version because we were worried about the bug I showed you before. And the new uh, version of Dorado, they need to, uh, a higher number of reads that we lose during the correction. So there might still be problems in the, in the Dorado correct command. 
Yeah, uh, it's the throughput, total, total uh, the sum of the lengths of these reads. You can see the, the drop in coverage that we have. And also the read, read length distribution that these train distributions of Hero that it seems to prefer some length in the output. To conclude, so uh, nonable reads improve assembly contiguities, but you pay in uh, incorrectness, unfortunately, because uh, nonable only assemblies have uh, have more contexts, more errors, and as you've seen, error correction works pretty good, but it's a cost also in terms of um, resources. You need GPUs, big GPUs, to be able to correct the reads in a couple of hours or days, so it feels less costly to run. Uh, I see data will come in the future, so we we able to, to use more for assemblers. Now I'm using more high five asm. The vertical we can use it also. We do we need for them for it. I see data. Thank you. Well, great work. That's really nice. It's coming along very, very well. Um, I'm a bit surprised it has been the heavens. Me too. One thing we need to scratch the surface a little bit there. I think we have to correct the high fire reads now. There are different ones in the high fire reads. Like yes, polymers? they are all poly. Yes, these uh, indels are from on the Oliver regions. Yes. I don't know what Now they work in a compressed space. They compress and then assemble. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kai Ni. I come from the University of Kentucky. Today, I'm so pleased to be here to present my project, which is named Tinomira to Tinomira Assembly of the SHR A3 RAT. Before, I tell you about the SHR genome assembly. I really want to know what is genome assembly. So the goal of the genome assembly is try to produce a contiguous and a, a complete genome. So before the traditional method of the assembly usually is traveling with the competitive uh, competitive region. Today we have the Oxford nanopore autonomies can overcome these challenges. So we'll give us the telomere, telomere assembly. So this is the, the summary we got. I think I need to clarify in here. We get the 34x high by our high fat data and the 87x in the high set data and 86x of the all the ultra, ultra known um, Oxford nanopore data, but it's a 70, oh, okay, sorry, it's 32x coverage of the over 100 KB and uh, 46 X for, for the color Illumina or genome sequence data. Is that the method? So the in the red box is the all data we connected and the, the tools we use the record to generate the initial assemblies and the rapid creation and the graph aligner, bandage NG and the another assembly is hyper atom and the different version of the record we usually use for the Gap filling, and uh, we generate the mitochondrial genome also, and then polish them in the genome. I will give you more to you in following slides. Okay, here we can use the bandage NG to visualize the uh, assembly graph. So a different colors gonna show you uh, different scaffolds. So we can use the reference to name the uh, each of the chromosomes, and uh, in this the uh, red. And circles, you can find chromosome 12, 11, and 3. They have a big tangles. And probably they are the, yeah, not tablet. Yes, there is the adding arrows in there. And the chromosome X and the Y have a tangle because they have the open apps somewhere. And chromosome 19, chromosome 4, and chromosome 16, they have a 
uh, two scaffolds and uh, they, they need to connect each other. So first step, we use the high set data to generate the uh, scaffold project view map. So in here, we name them the, uh, this is the unity three, four, five is a scaffold's name. And we name them as chromosome four with the reference. And then the, in here is evidence show from the high set data evidence show the two Intix uh, should be connected together, so we can connect with uh, through the gaps. This is the very big scale. In the small scales, we can find some more more scaffolds to be connected with chromosome 19. Since we get the gap and we or we get the uh, initial assemblies, we can align back the optional OG data to the assemblies. So and then. This is the first example I show in here is about chromosome 16. So you query the ONT data, how many reads can across from the uh, Unitix 4 19 to Unitix 4 18 and the number of the reads across. Yeah, 18 to 17 is the same. And the 19 to 17 is only two reads. Then we can query about how many reads across from the light from the 18 to 16. It's about 66 reads. It's the 16 to 19 is about 84 reads. And uh, across back to the 16 to 17, it's about two times of the uh, ONT data support in flows. So which means we fi fix this tangle by using the pass with the lighting to the 16 and back to and the to 17, back to 16 and then pass through to the uh, 18. The uh, second gap filling example is still in the in chromosome 16. So we use the hyperatom with the exactly same input data, and we generate the uh, context from the hyperatom and uh, extract the end of the, these two of scaffolds and then alignment back to the hyperatom whole assemblies. And we find these two scaffolds exactly match in the sum well. So we will use this. Uh, uh, 85, yeah, KB, something like that, and to fill in the gaps in the chromosome 16 and connect them together. It's a, um, another example about the uh, simple no synchronization repeats. In here, it's in the chromosome one. You can find the number is the 28.8x, it means the high back coverage in this region. It's the 28.4 is the same in the units of Unitix 4, 1, 20. So, but in here, it's about the Unitix 4, 3, 4, 2. It's about the choice of the coverage in here. And we search the path from the ONT data. Yes, they have reads to support. The 3, 4, 2 have to uh, go through the twice. So it uh, makes sense in here. So we can fix the angle using a 2, 2 to 3, to 2, 3, 4, 2, and back to uh, twice, and then back to the 1, 2, 0. And otherwise, in here, it shows the only we can through the high back and coverage. We can easily do to fix the about the almost a very similar length and a very similar coverage. So this is only a hexagonal region in the end of the chromosome two. It's another one. It's a little bit more complex tangle than previous one. We can find some key lows. Like in here is unit unit for 166 and calculate the how many reads support from the eight from 18 to 166 okay it's 57 and calculate how many reads pass through the 81 and how many reads pass through 82 yes only one reads pass through this one and and the 56 pass through this one so probably we can use this path it's a we, we, we do the same for the 166 to the 100 oh, sorry 314. Yeah, have two ways either from the 168 or from the 100 or from the 300, 315. So the five reads are about, 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 about this reads and the two reads are about this reads. And then you can use the previous method to figure out how to figure out how many tangles or how many repeats through from the 315 in here or how many it hangs through from the 169. Okay, this is the mayor in the assemblies, I can say it's the RDN arrows. But anyway we can we can figure out this is the unit for 166 is in here. It's 
alignment back to the reference, we can find this belongs to chromosome, chromosome 12. Again, this is the triangle, the uh, is the telomeres. So this one is belongs to 12, this one belongs to 3, this one belongs to 11. So which means, yeah, another 12 is maybe around here. Yeah, and uh, we know the chromosome 3 it came through the RNA DNA arrows and back to tangle and back to this nodes. And again, chromosome 11 going through whatever how many in number repeats in here and then go back to the 11, 12 do the same. So it's gonna be our future work to figure out the how many repeats in adding errors. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the polish process, I really want mm, to point in here to avoid over polishing of the nuclear mitochondrial regions. So we have to, add to generate the mitochondrial genome first. So the mild high fat gonna help us to generate the mitochondrial genome. So um, after that, we're gonna use the deep polisher with the pike bio high fat data to polish the, our assemblies and the pylon with the Illumina data to polish our assemblies. Okay, do the genome comparison with the NCBI recently re referenced as A3, no, not A3 versions in NCBI compared with our T2T A3. Uh, we can find the M50 increase from the 138 megabits to the 144 megabits, and the total length is uh, decreased a little bit. But I I make a red color in here. It's about the gaps of the total in assemblies, only seven gaps, and uh, we we detect uh, telomeres is 42 in total, and the 20 of the chromosomes is a telomere to telomere. Only chromosome seven and chromosome Y is uh, only have a one telomeres in the end. This is the very common um, uh, evaluation tools. One is called MESCO um, to uh, using the if using the um, database to uh, evaluate the how many single copies copy genomes from the uh, for the assemblies. It's decreased increase from the one. One three of oh, thirty thousand two hundred seventy six to the thirty thousand three hundred eighty eight. Like other tools is called the cambliasm. Still, the single copy is increased from the ninety seven point nine to the ninety eight point five two. Um, one more uh, evaluation tool is called the Macri. It's based on the Kamer. So. We can, mm, based on the cameras, you get the error rate in the, our assemblies comparison also with NCBI, NCBI A3. It's uh, in, decreased from the 4.1 to 2.8, and the Q value increased from the uh, 43.8 to the 45.4. Completeness score increased from the just a little. So, but which means, okay, because this is based on the camera, so which means it's the previous version of the A3 in the uh, NCBI, it's also very good as well. Okay, in here, I really want to give a big thanks for the uh, Dr. Sergey Cohen and, uh, yeah, and uh, Dr. Adam Phillips and uh, uh, Elizabeth Hosem and Dr. Melissa Smith and uh, Dr. Ted Kaltrash and Dr. Peter Doss. Yeah, I would like happy to take the questions. Sorry, I didn't hear you. You have this not being from DNA repeats. Yes, correct. So, is there evidence of variation within a sample, within a sequence tree? Of variable numbers of ribosomal rib DNA repeats, and are you going to be able to resolve that or not? Mm. Or is it okay. just a challenge with the sample? Yeah, I mean it's it's a big challenge for even though for the human T two T assembly, and uh, and it's also I mean it's different between the like, individuals, so we only can use the camera to figure out how many total copies in the whole gene, whole gene, but I mean, it's hard to uh, to identify that in each of the How many copies? Yeah. Yeah. 
The first slide was a table of all of the different sequence data that you have that you might not have like that you have. If you had to do it over again, would you get exactly that? Do you think you spent too much of some things or too little of some things? Or do you think those were sort of the optimal values to, to do what you were trying to do? Okay, let me ask a question first. <laughs> so okay. you, you mentioned our stuff from the same data I got in here. Yeah. And then I will get the same exact model. No, I'm asking if you had to do over again, right? Like this was for A3 and A3. Let's say that we're doing these. You were going to do the same kind of project over again with a different inverse strain. Mm -hmm. Do you think these were the optimal values and ratios of the different kinds of reads? Yeah. Um, or if you had to do it over again, would you maybe want more of some things and less of some things? I mean, um, in RAS, um, individual significance and uh, this A3 is the uh, inverse. So right. we get the impact on high five is about the 34 x coverage. So, yeah, it's recommended in level 7 to the 5 coverage for each habitat. If you want an outgrowth, maybe it should be 70x. Yeah, yeah, also, yeah, it's based on the different images. But if you think these were basically the right numbers to use? Yes, I recommend it. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we we talked with Sergey Horn, uh, there's a huge uh, one of the most developed it, it seems to be a consensus of opinions that if you if you have to go uh, in excess on anything, it's the oxygen. That's that's you know, the, the, the pack by the by, pack by we're, we're about where we need to be. Um, the high C, we're about where we need to be. But if you want to make it just a little bit better. Yeah. And that's 86x, but then you take about 21. 31. 31. Oh, 32. 32. 32. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is recommend, recommended uh, coverage by the team of the then if your genome is more complex, probably you need more data. Yeah, yeah. And just to add one more editorial comment, yeah. you've spent a special amount of time and expense and effort to ensure that we were capturing an entire germline genome. All the human TSM is except the TSM from being uh, edited assemblies. The ones that are coming out of all the schools and the cell lines. So if you're interested in recombining the regions like these receptors, if you problem have a chance, you won't get full representation in those types of assemblies. So in this assembly, you can get that. I think maybe I didn't get fully. The way you describe your pipeline, you have two terrorists. But it's just one pipeline. Uh, I think this uh, this. Oh, I see. I do know. Okay. Yeah. My slides are follow um with this one. I can do something. No, it's okay. Um, we were scheduled to take a half hour break and then have the speaker. So you guys have to make a decision. Um, we're, we can we can talk. You guys can network. We can you know be released for the day. Um, who is going? Who is interested in hanging out and then going to Chantal's party? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
It is a that's what Michaela said was five fifteen nine ten. You saw five o'clock. So somewhere between five and five fifteen, and it's a ten minute walk max over to campus. And Mark said that he would escort people over there. So what's the title? Do you remember? Yeah. So you have like that geo kind of thing? Yeah. Kind of a big name. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it'll be a spectacular time. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay, we're cool with it. And you don't know. Yeah, what's up with the number two? Hot chicken. Hot chicken. It's just hands for the day and leave your work stuff tonight and leave your room tomorrow. And, you, and not, it, it doesn't have to be a consensus. Some people can decide that they'd like to hang out and go, and some people will go. It's, it's about 350. So I'm not sure if people heard that. If you're going to go to that talk, make sure you wear your badge because they're going to actually be back and come in. Your badge will get you in. But they can let me love it. We were going to try live streaming, but that's when we thought it was at four o'clock. So, um, yeah. And I go on mute tonight. Who wants to go to this talk or who would be interested in saying? He's giving a poster tonight. No, no, no. I think she might be able to do it. So I wanted to thank everybody who's on Zoom. I don't know who's still on. It looks like we still have some folks. So um, we'll continue tomorrow morning. And um, thank you for participating.